Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, yeah. praise God. God's going to grow this thing, and it's going to be amazing. And thank you for Clarice for what you're doing with the women, and the men are growing, and that's what we want to see. Anyway, we are in Ephesians chapter two, just verses eleven and thirteen. Therefore, remember that you, formerly the Gentiles, that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. We're going to break this down, but just in a nutshell, this is Paul talking to those who are non-Jews. The uncircumcision, formerly uncircumcised, were non-Jews. They were Greeks and Romans and everything else in between. Okay? So he's talking to them. He said, formerly, you guys, the Gentiles in the flesh who were born non-Jew, were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, by the Jews. And they were looked down upon. And I'll explain that in a minute. Which is performed by the flesh, by hands, and I'm assuming we all know what circumcision is. So I won't explain what that means. <laughs> Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But here's one of the biggest buts in the world. And I don't mean that 80 song. But now in Christ Jesus who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Formerly in Christ Jesus, but now, but now, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He begins this by saying, remember, he said, therefore remember you are formerly Gentiles, that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, were called uncircumcision by the, uh, by the circumcision. And then the one, in verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from God. Don't forget where you were. So I want to talk about two things today. Where we were, because we're the Gentiles. Unless you have Jewish blood in you, we're, ge we're Gentiles. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? We're going to talk about where we were and where we are based on what Paul is talking to us about. So he said, Gentiles in the flesh. Well, what does that mean in terms of his uh, insinuation? He's saying, you are not part of the chosen people, which we've talked about before. You are not part of the lineage that declared that they are God's people. They were the true initial true sons and daughters of God. They were the Jewish people. They were the ones who God had chosen. So what does that entail? They were not, or they, uh, the Jews were under the covering and fathering of God. So he's saying to us, there was a time, number one, you know, we were Gentiles in the flesh. You were not under the covering and the fathering and the grace of God. That special thing that the Jewish people had. You did not have that. You were not a part of it, number one. This is who we were, keep in mind. Second thing as to who we were, because we were not under the grace and covering of God, right? And, and we're going to go back and talk about who we are after I go through the who we were. We were uncircumcised. Now, what does it mean to be circumcised? Circumcision was a representation of covenant with God. Difference between a covenant and a contract is covenant or a contract, this is what I do and this is what you're going to do. If you don't do this, I won't do that. You break it. A covenant is, this is our covenant. You do this, I do that. You don't do this, this is what I end up doing. And, and just read the book of Numbers where you see the covenant God has. It, for those who are who stay true to the precepts and the word of God, part of the covenant is there's blessing. But then there's also curse. 
for those who don't. And at the heart of the curse, basically, is not having the covering of God. See, a lot of times people, God isn't going to necessarily curse you. What he does is he takes his hand of covering off of us, which leaves us open. So don't misunderstand what that word curse means, especially in the Old Testament when it comes to a relationship with God. As a Christian, as a son of God, I am under his covering. So his hand is on me. And the only way his hand can't be on me is if I choose to step out of the grace of his hand. If God is saying, I've got you covered, stay right here. And I say, now, Lord, I'm going to do it by my own way. Thank you, but no thanks. And I step away, then I can't be covered by his hand. But the beautiful thing is, when I go, Lord, I screwed up. Can I? Can we get this right? Say, Come on back in. Come on. Let me cover you again. Yeah. So we were uncircumcised, not in covenant with God, did not have that relationship with God. We were separated from Christ. Number three, we were separated from Christ. Now the word Christ literally means Messiah and anointed one. It wasn't Jesus' name. He was Jesus the Christ. Okay? Okay. So we were separated, remember he says separated from the anointed one, the Messiah, the salvation that was to come for Israel. Well, how does that play into this? We were at one point not even in a position to be saved. We may not even know what salvation was. We live this life, we die, poof, it's over. So we had no hope for a future beyond the last breath we take. We were not part of a group that is waiting for a savior. We didn't even know, realize we needed a savior. We were not waiting for this. We didn't have that longing in our hearts and spirits for what is to come. This was not even a part of our, our thing. Salvation wasn't even on our radar at one point. We were not aware that we even needed to be saved by a savior. I want you to think about the time this is written. Paul is writing to Greeks and Romans, right? And I thought about like those Greeks who worship Greek gods, their idea of life after death, the Gentiles of his day, were Elysian fields, is what in Greek mythology, the Elysian fields. But here's the interesting thing, and then you have like in Norse mythology Valhalla, but you have to die a certain way to get to Valhalla. You know, all these different mythologies, right? But here's the difference. In those places, even in those mythologies, yes, you live happy-go-lucky, running through grass, according to their mythology. But you're not in the presence of the one who saved you. You're just there. You start your second life, so to speak, but you're not with your creator. You're not in relationship. You don't have, you're not sitting there hanging out with Zeus. Zeus is still on Mount Olympus. You know what I mean? There's a difference here. So they were part of people who didn't need know what a relationship with a true relationship with their God was. Didn't know what it saved. Worst thing we were is we were excluded from the Commonwealth. That's just another word from being a citizen of a city. We did not have citizenship. And as a citizen, we have citizen privileges, right? We vote, we have different opportunities that strangers don't have. So he's saying you were excluded from a, being a true citizen of Jerusalem from the rights and privileges that came with that. That was not available to you, but now we're gonna, uh, we're gonna have that available to us. We were strangers, number five, strangers to covenants of promise. 
So we were not, we were Gentiles, we were uncircumcised, not in covenant, we were separated from the Messiah, we were not citizens. So if you're not citizens, then you couldn't be family members. And strangers to the covenant of promise, that's the hope in Christ. That's the inheritance that we have in Christ. So we, we're not on the name of our inheritance, of, of what the Father wrote up, what he has for us. We had no right to it, did not have right to inheritance. We were not family, not part of the family of God, not a son or daughter, because we have to be saved to be a son and a daughter. We have to be in relationship with our Father, have that connection. We were guests and servants without privileges. We were guests and servants without privileges. You can say, oh, you're like family to me, and I can come over to your house any time of the day. But if your bedroom door is closed, I'm not walking in your bedroom. But if my daughter barges in our bedroom, and she don't care if it's closed or not, <laughs> that's privileges of a son and a daughter. Right? We were guests and servants. We had nothing to look forward to in this life and nothing to look forward to beyond this, which leads to number six. He says, without hope, with no hope and without God in this world. So without hope, in this world, we were hopeless. We had nothing to look forward to in terms of the future or hold on to for something better. You could literally you would think this is the best it's going to get. This is the best it could get. So let me do whatever I can to get the best out of it. Or, as we know, sometimes when we're in a negative place, we just get comfortable in a negative place. We stay in our spin cycle and we just get stuck there. Because there's no hope that we have for something greater. Nothing to look forward to. And then he says, ends it, and without God in the world, we're far off. Without a God we're, means we're missing the mark. We don't have someone to guide us to hit the mark. We have no point of reference Right? And yesterday at the men's meeting, at a round table, one of the things that was brought up, you know, was mentoring and, you know, how, you know, we, we were in Timothy, so we talked about how Timothy had Paul to mentor him. And somebody brought up, you know, sometimes there's no mentoring, there's nothing there. How do you know to stay in line? Well, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit right now. We have the example of Jesus. But those who choose to ignore God, when I chose to ignore God, when I did not have God in my life, I had no point of reference. So how did I measure what's right and wrong, what I should do and shouldn't do? I looked what other people are doing, right? It didn't matter if it was biblically right or wrong. If they looked happy, I did it. Why do I drink? Why do I smoke? Why do I get hot? Why do I, you know, engage in premarital sexual activity? Why do I do these things? Because if it feels good, it looks good on the outside, without keeping reference to what it's doing to your soul and to your heart, the wounds it's creating within you. And, and we can talk about different things about that. But they had no God. They're missing the mark continuous, spilling our wheels to no end or gain. And we were clueless and directionless. This is who we were, right? We were. But then something amazing happens. We were afar off in Christ Jesus. But you and me and I have been brought near by the blood of by the blood of the Messiah. We were brought near by his blood. We can never shortchange the power that is in the blood. All those things Paul just talked about, reminding that this is where you were. His blood, when he died on that cross, for our sins, 
And when we look him in the eye and simply say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I repent. I change my mind of the way I've been living my life. I'm sorry. I want to make things right right now. He just takes that eraser and wipes all that other stuff away. It's done. Mm. That, that quickly, it is done. So who we are right now, as a Gentile right now, I am an adopted son and daughter. And there's many verses, but I'm just going to, for each one of these, I'm just going to share a few things that highlight. Ephesians 1.5, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as son, his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will. Yeah. I remember as I was reading that when uh, um, Eric and Nicole first adopted Xander. And being their neighbor, we knew their trials and tribulations and, and everything in between. And I remember the very first day they had Xander as a four months old in their arms. They were already in love with him. Mm -hmm. And they were just his foster parents at that time. Yeah. In their hearts, they had adopted him two years before they actually adopted yeah. him. Mm -hmm. Okay? Imagine that with Christ. We were predestined to be his adopted sons and daughters. When he first thought of us, his whole intention with us is to be adopted as his sons and daughters. That's it. We were already in his heart. But when we, it was our choice to choose to accept that or to be a runaway and reject that. If he, uh, I'm going to read you a different version. This is, I think, the amplified version of this, which I love. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great delight. If you ever question that, remember, he delights in you. You and I give him great delight. Now, we have covenant with God. Galatians 2, 26 through 29, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized in Christ Jesus have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ Jesus, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. I don't have to preach that. I can, that speaks for itself right there. As a son and daughter, I am automatically in covenant with him. I'm in covenant with my father. then we have a Savior. Jesus is our Savior, is our Messiah. We recognize him. We all know John 3.16. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or Gentile. So now, he's our salvation to the Jew first, and but also to, the, to us. I have, a, I have salvation. I have a future way beyond this life. Something to look forward to. Ephesians 2.19 says, So now, so then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So now you are part of that commonwealth. You are a citizen of that commonwealth. You have now citizen privileges of that town. It's amazing. I can't tell you. Living in Keysburg for 16 years and ministering in Keyport, people now looking back see how I was treated as an outsider. But literally, the day I moved into that house, the day we signed... Uh, the paperwork and that house officially became ours here in Keyport 
Everyone's attitude towards us changed. Everyone. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Oh, we want you to be involved on this board. Now we want you to come to this thing. And I'm getting letters and invitations for different things. And the response is different. All of a sudden, now I'm welcomed in. Whereas before, I was liked, but kept on the outside. It, it, there's something about when you are a citizen, even more so a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, when you're a citizen of a commonwealth or a city, who's protecting you? The heavenly army of his commonwealth. The, the military, the police force, the, the whoever. You have protection. You have covering. You have rights and privileges. You have the law on your side more. You have authority that is behind you. Everything changes. We are citizens in the kingdom. And here's the thing. No one can ever take our citizens away, citizenship away. I could never stop being a citizen of the United States of America unless I turn it down, reject it, and decide to be a citizen somewhere else. And some other countries you can have dual citizenship, but unless I reject my citizenship, I will always be a citizen of this town this country, I mean. And as in the kingdom of God, I am always a citizen. But I'm more than a citizen. I'm a family member now in the kingdom of God. So there's an inheritance waiting for me, which we just read in Galatians 2.29. I have a promise that he has. And then I have hope, number six. Before I didn't have hope, but Romans 15.13 says, may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So, where who, where's my hope lie? In him. In him. So as I put my hope in him, he is filling me with peace and joy for what is here and what is to come. And then Paul uh, uh, writes to the Romans as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Trusting in him, his Holy Spirit, uh, he's given me his hope, I mean his peace and joy. And as his, over, his spirit is overflowing in my life, my, uh, my hope is increasing because of his power in me. Even when nothing looks like it has hope. Mm even when I'm very, very frustrated. And then, the last thing that I am, I was once far off, but I was brought in by his blood, and by his blood, it means I was kept, I was brought close to him. I am close to him now. I not only see the mark, but I can hit the mark, because I'm close to him. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. 1 John 4.13, uh, this is how we know that we live in him, and he in us. He has given us his spirit. John 14.18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. I will not leave you as Gentiles who are in the flesh, not part of my chosen people. I will not leave you not in covenant with me. I will not leave you separate from me. I will not leave you excluded from citizenship in my kingdom. I will not leave you strangers without an inheritance. I will not leave you without hope. I will not leave you at a great distance from my heart. But I bring you in close. How do I do that? Through the blood of Jesus. Blood, by the blood of Christ, we have been brought near.
Nothing else can bring us near with the blood of Jesus. Now, you can look at this and say this is just a simple salvation message. And some of us may need that. Some of us may need to recommit or rededicate or commit for the first time our lives to Jesus today. Amen to that. But how many of us have not fully allowed the blood of Jesus to come over us, to bring us near, to do all those things? We've maybe taken two or three of these things, maybe four, and worked with them, but we haven't fully stepped into the other two, three, four, five of them. Kind of halfway did it. Yeah, the blood got me this far. The blood made him my savior, so I'm okay. The blood made me covenant with him, so I'm okay. But what about all the other stuff? Think about what we need to do right now. I love what Anthony did earlier, just bringing us that place of just basic repentance. And saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Let's get it right and get going. It's that simple. Yeah. Get it right and let's get moving. But there's more. There's more. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So just listen to the Holy Spirit right now, what he wants to do. Would you stand with me? I want you to ask Holy Spirit, Lord, if you can't stand it, you don't have to do it. Just position yourself to hear from God. Because you all can hear. And I just bless you if you think you don't. I just rebuke that thought in the name of Jesus and I release the peace over your heart and mind that you can hear from God in Jesus' name. You can hear. Sometimes it's just a fleeting thing, but you can hear. And I know God's been already speaking to many of us in this room today. Holy Spirit, show us what one of these we need to just get right with you right now. Just clean up with you right now. And let your blood come over it. This is what I'm seeing in the spirit right now. I see like a river, a red river, kind of symbolizing the blood of Jesus, his blood flowing. But you know, the water will flow where there is room to flow. If the river is flowing, but there's a branch of the river that goes to the right, part of that is going to go to the right. Part of that's going to go to the left if there's something left. <coughs> and those little branches off the river are just these things that we're talking about today. So which branch has been blocked off that we just need to open up and let his blood come in and cover? Holy Spirit, bring a revelation to each one of us today. What we need to submit to you and just remove the dam. And let your blood flow in that area right now. Thank you, Jesus. Just, just sit with Jesus right now. Listen to him. And do what needs to be done. When you get that revelation, just say, Jesus, if you're willing, I'm willing to remove that my dam. I'm willing to remove what's been blocking me. Blocking you. Come, Jesus. Let the blood flow. Let the river flow. Do you want to accept Jesus in your heart for the first time today? Or even recommit yourself to him? simply say, Jesus, I thank you for what you did on the cross for me. I believe and accept what you did. I thank you for the blood that covers all my sins. I 
thank you for your love that took on my sins. And I repent right now. I just simply change my mind at the direction my life's been going. And I want it to start to go with you. I want to go with you. Go where you go. I want to be with you. So I thank you, God. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to come and fill me up right now. Come and fill me up right now, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. without the love. It's because you are loved. You are loved. I am loved. Jesus. I'm just going to let Jacob pray. I'm going to play. And you guys just let Holy Spirit speak to you. When you're done, you're done. But don't be done till he's done. <laughs> 